Hello and welcome. You're watching This Is Today TV. I'm Sakshi Batra. Well, if commodities are on your mind, then this show is definitely for you because I've got the person who has the right insights on commodities all across the board. We're going to be talking about gold, silver, precious, non-precious metals. We're also going to be talking about crude oil, natural gas, and every commodity that you can actually think of. In case you're thinking of investing, you should definitely hear this voice out. I'm going to be joined by somebody very special. Mr. Sagarwal Sahar joins in. He's the president. At uh, S and P Global Commodity Insights, welcome to Business Today TV. Great to have you with us, uh, Sogata, and welcome to India. Thank you, Sashi, and great to be here. Uh, so, Sogata, you know, let's get right, dive right in because we want to talk about commodities, and you're the best person to answer all those queries. You know, last year we were talking about a commodity boom, a super cycle, but you know, this year so far it's been a roller coaster road. Uh, in the last uh, six months or so, we've seen uh, you know metals and all sort of commodities, uh, you know, falling from their uh, you know money multi month highs, and uh, they've been tumbling from their March peak as well. So, do you think that boom is now somewhat over? Sakshi, firstly, you know, I would say that for the commodity markets, yeah. we are definitely in very interesting times. And I say interesting okay. <laughs> because, you know, I've kind of run out of using the word uh, unprecedented because everything that happens for the first time seems unprecedented. But what's going on in the world right now across major commodity classes is uh, the impact of many different opposing forces. And I'll talk about commodities broadly in two separate groups. One yeah. is energy and one is non-energy yes. because the implications are quite different. Right. Let's start with energy. Um, and energy obviously is a huge commodity class and you know you includes everything from crude oil to refined products to natural gas etc the, the three big forces acting on the energy markets right now mm. one is the need for energy transition and you've heard this term before and uh, people and public Absolutely. you know policy makers everybody understands that mm. over time there has to be a transition from existing sources of fuel to more renewable and sustainable sources of fuel the second is around energy security and especially for countries like India, where a lot of energy gets imported, there is the need to secure future sources of energy. And then the third is energy affordability. Yeah. And uh, obviously for a growing economy and for prosperity, you need cheap sources of energy because that's what fuels transportation, factories, etc. So you will see these three things interplaying each other. And in the backdrop of all this, there are some other factors like geopolitics. Yes. And there's also the threat of a recession. And a recession could be quite a dampener on energy prices because recessions typically lead to lower demand for energy and consequently lower prices. So we'll see how these three things play out. Um, our general sense is that energy prices will be elevated for okay. some time to okay. come. And you will see a lot of volatility, right? Because there's a lot of talk about different things in the markets, price gaps, um, you know, uh, transition fuels, etc. So you'll see a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. So I think people should generally assume that there will be a lot of volatility. Anybody who doesn't like volatility, this is probably not a great place to be. <laughs> okay. And then shifting gears to the rest of the commodity classes, yeah. it's hard to generalize the rest of them. Mm -hmm. They're very different demand and supply drivers sure. across the board. Mm -hmm. If you look at agriculture versus uh, precious metals versus ferrous metals versus all of those, mm -hmm. um, generally prices have stayed high. Out there, there's another factor for the non-energy commodity classes, which is around supply chain disruption. Yeah. And we expect that our research indicates that that will continue. So we should expect elevated prices. But I will say that, you know, at Commodity Insights, mm -hmm. uh, we have 4,500 people, most of them focused on data and research, yes. and they are spending their time thinking about exactly the kind of questions you're answering so that we can help our customers make decisions with conviction. Absolutely, I can see giving data meaning like never before. That's going to be your focus, and that's what we're going to be relying upon for all the information to pass on to our viewers as well. Since you touched upon all the right points in your opening comments, I'm going to be uh, taking that one by one for all the expanding on that as well. So, uh, for commodities, both energy and for the non energy, like you segregated, what is the outlook for the rest of the year? We anticipate that oil, for example, mm. will stay north of $100 a barrel okay. globally. Yeah. And uh, we and, and anticipate that energy prices will also stay elevated for quite some time to come. Gas prices for LNG prices, for example, mm. are at an all-time high. We don't see a lot of relief in that, yes. uh, you know, the pressure that's built up those prices. 
Uh, so we expect it to be high. We also expect reasonable levels of volatility yeah. across the board on yeah. that. Yeah. Um, on the commodity, the non-energy commodity side, we expect uh, prices will stay high, but there will be a lot of variation depending yeah. on commodity classes. The, the one thing I will say in all of this, which is really hard to predict, yeah. which is why we look at scenarios and our whole business is based on helping customers understand different scenarios, yeah. is that, you know, there's geopolitical events, there's uh, public policy intervention, there's governmental intervention, and that can turn things around in a heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, export controls or import duties, etc., can quick, quickly sure. and dramatically change prices. But mm -hmm. in general, I think we are in for a cycle of elevated prices across the board. Okay, so since you pointed out about uh, the energy prices, especially crude, and you believe uh, north of $100 is what you expect going forward right now, the WTI crude is, I think, somewhere around $90. It has slipped about 25% from its highs right now. Uh, for India, uh, you know, there's a two-pronged problem right here that we face. One, if there are elevated prices because we are the importers, we face a problem there. Oil prices slipping too much gives us the, you know, problems of demand getting hit as well. So what is the, uh, you know, exact level that we should be comfortable with? Could you yeah. help all of you as well? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. There's a lot <laughs> in those questions. So the first I would say is that going back to oil prices, crude yeah. prices, goes back to the point about volatility, right? Mm -hmm. So as I said, we should expect elevated prices, Sakshi. So, you know, we don't see prices like $60 a barrel coming back anytime soon, mm -hmm. but um, volatility will be a thing. So it'll be 95 at some point, 150 in another week, and it'll go up and down. And, you know, not everybody can stomach volatility, right? So it's important to keep in mind that the volatility will be there, right? So that's important. Um, for a net energy importer like uh, India, for example, with crude prices, obviously um, high prices creates a twofold problem. One is, uh, you know, a lot of the end consumption gets subsidized, whether it be fertilizer or, you know, retail prices of petrol and diesel. It creates a huge problem for the government to balance the budgets there. Yeah. And uh, for industries where there is no subsidy, you know, it causes uh, competitiveness problems you know, as your input costs go up. Um, my sense is that on the too lower side, it probably doesn't, you know, keep too many people away. Yeah. But the high prices of energy, I think there is a silver lining in that because mm -hmm. the sustained high prices of energy will um, drive or accelerate the move towards energy transition. Yes. It, it will force, uh, you know, companies, governments across the world, not just in India, to really think about alternative sources of fuel. And as they are having that conversation as they're thinking about what to move to, generally the move is towards more sustainable sources yes. of fuel. Yes. So, you know, and uh, I think you'll see more of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are seeing our customers asking a lot more about that. And energy transition, as I said, um, is one of the areas where we are spending a lot of time helping our customers think about yeah. what are the potential different um, energy baskets that could exist, yeah. what are the demand outlooks, what are the technological developments that are going to happen. So it's an exciting time to be in the energy and commodity business. What about the natural gas prices? Because they have run up like, you know, 125%. Help us with the reasons yeah. of the, you know, why why this kind of a rally and how much more to go? Sure. So mm -hmm. natural, natural gas prices, you know, we've seen similar volatility in the past as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because natural gas prices can quickly get impacted by small supply and demand variations. So, for example, a few years ago, there was an unusually cold winter in Japan and South Korea, and that led to huge spikes in natural gas prices, which again quickly corrected once the you know winter passed. Right. What you're seeing now is basically a shift of a demand supply imbalance, as in Europe, they're reducing their uh, consumption of gas from yes. Russia and yes. are looking at alternative sources. There is a bit of a bottleneck around, you know, uh, a lot of demand for very little supply. Mm -hmm. Also with um, with the gas, you have to remember that uh, um, you have to liquefy it, which means you have to build a factory at the export port, a terminal as they call it, a liquefaction factor facility where they take the gas, compress it, Absolutely. put it on a ship, move it over and then reverse the process, right? And those factories or those terminals, those gasification and um, you know, regasification, liquefaction and regasification facilities are very expensive to build. Mm. They take a lot of time to build. Mm. So over time, we see that, you know, some of the natural gas, liquefied gas prices, LNG prices will come down. Yeah. But in the interim, this whole demand supply shock that has happened yes, yes. will keep prices higher. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's one more area where we are seeing that supply shock and that is agri commodities and that's on the back of the Russia Ukraine war. I mean, oil seeds and we saw yeah. wheat and all the edible oils, you know, all of those going through a very turmoil period. Um, do you think uh, the supply chain issues will continue in 2023 as well? Uh, well, they are promising signs that they won't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, with agriculture, there's many variable inputs. So one, of course, is the weather, right? And uh, for example, this year, if you look at India, fortunately, it's been a good monsoon, which definitely helps with domestic production. But, you know, if you look at geopolitics, at least there are some promising signs that export of, uh, uh, you know, uh, wheat from the Black Sea area will continue. And if that happens, that obviously becomes a bit of a relief valve. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you know, looking at some serious challenges around very high prices globally and you know, certain countries can't even afford grains. Mm -hmm. But again, those are the precisely the kind of questions that our researchers, our team of researchers are spending a lot of time yeah. thinking about. And we are sifting through massive amounts of data to be able to um, come up with insights which our customers can use to make decisions. And uh, those are great questions, but yeah, there's a lot of people asking those questions. That's true. Uh, another question that would be of interest to all our viewers would be that, you know, most of who are ex uh, investors, that between stock markets and commodities, where should you be? So I'll ask you, what are you bullish on? Yeah, because we're seeing some recovery in the stock markets. Is it the right time to perhaps shift out of stock markets? You know, book your profits right there and perhaps look at the dip that is there in the commodity space and buy that dip. Is that worth it all? Where are you at over here? So as a business, our focus is to make the highest quality data, research, and insights available to mm. our customers. Mm. And uh, we we don't take a view on you know uh, whether they should be long or short or invest or get out of the market. Mm. What we do take a view on is that we want to be the people who have the highest quality data, research, insights available to our customers. And that enables them to make a decision with conviction as to what they want to do. And uh, I will add that you know our colleagues in India uh, play an important role in enabling us to, to do that globally. At Commodity Insights, we have 4,500 people globally, and about 20 to 25% of their workforce is in India. Mm -hmm. And they're working on problems like software engineering to sift through all this data, data scientists, we have researchers who track global markets from India, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they spend their time mm -hmm. thinking about these questions so that people can make good decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the one space I think I haven't touched upon in detail is the metals, uh, both Paris and non-Paris, your outlook on both. I mean, especially on the zinc, aluminium, iron ore and copper front, we have seen that they're at multi-month lows. Is it a time to buy or just stay away? Because we've seen, uh, you know, many experts just talking about that perhaps this could be catching a falling knife. Where are you at with that? Yeah, look, um, you know, metals is an area we track very closely, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at, and I should talk a little about, you know, the business per se in terms of what we cover. So at, at this point, with the merger of uh, S&P Global and IHS Market, so actually we cover pretty much every commodity class and the entire value chain in each of those commodity classes. And metals are a small but an important growing part of it. Mm. Um, there's obviously been a fair amount of volatility in the recent past, and you know, I'm sure your viewers have been tracking the volatility and the dips in the prices. Mm. And what we are focused on is just making sure that we can provide good understanding to the markets around what is causing those dips. Yes. And we look at a lot of demand, supply, forecast. We look at imbalances, we run proprietary models to be able to forecast that mm -hmm. and then provide a view on um, what we what we think will happen. I will say that, you know, we also don't produce a single point forecast anymore because, you know, nobody knows what will really happen in the world. But we have very informed views and we provide scenarios, which, uh, you know, as I would encourage your viewers to visit our websites and uh, you know, snbglobal.com forward slash commodity insights. And they'll get, we have a lot of free stuff out there yeah. as well, which provides a fair amount of outlook around what's going to happen to some of these major commodity classes. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your thought process on both the Paris and non-Paris, uh, the outlook for FY23 and beyond? Um, I, our, our sense is that, uh, you know, uh, there is going to be a fair amount of uh, supply chain bottlenecks, which will cause... Um, obviously dislocations in demand and supply, which could lead to you know, elevated prices. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, so actually, if you keep in mind that there is a real chance of a recession, our economists put the 
Uh, in the recent reports that we published, our economists put the chances somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of a recession globally. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a countervailing factor. So, you know, if that happens, it takes a lot of the pressure off the demand and that obviously reduces prices. But it's, it's those two things I, I think one has to watch very carefully. And we are tracking both of those very carefully, yeah. how they play out. Absolutely. And one point to connect that is the U.S. Federal Reserve at its point. Now we are waiting the U.S. inflation data. And then, of course, uh, we will see the U.S. Federal Reserve move. We've already seen state hikes coming, although they have ruled out a recession for now. Uh, and But do you think that, you know, as was anticipated, the global central banks were on a very, very aggressive path to rate hikes. Is that going to be changing? Are they going to be very less aggressive at this point in time? What is your view? Since inflation right now is the bigger uh, yeah. point and we still have to watch out for uh, you know, further data. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, you bring up a great point, actually, about the whole inflation piece. Um, I think central banks globally, and in particular the US, mm -hmm. um, you know, they've been very, very aggressive and um, head-on tackling the inflation threat. And uh, they seem to be more focused on containing, containing inflation right now than being concerned about a recessionary outlook. Yeah. And if that continues, and it's you know somewhat hard to predict what a central bank or a collective central bank is going to do, but if that continues, uh, it could there it probably elevates the chances that it fit things into a recession. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, con containing inflation seems to be a headline focus area for these. But I would also point out that you know the number we look at for inflation, call it a seven percent in the U.S. or you know five percent in another market, that is a blended average headline number, yeah. and there's a lot behind it. Sure. So, for instance, you know if you look at energy price inflation, which is a big part of the you know energy basket. Um, consumption basket in most countries and especially in markets where um, price energy prices are not capped at the retail level, that is a serious challenge. And even you know raising interest rates is probably not going to help lower those in, you know energy prices right. because the demand supply levers there are very very different. So um, we'll see what happens with you know containing of inflation, but. Um, portion of that basket which is related to energy prices will probably stay elevated for a while. Mm, okay, so since you also said that you know your team has put out a 40 to 50 percent chance of uh, you know global recession perhaps coming in uh, 2023, uh, usually we have always seen that you know how precious metals like gold and silver they are always preferred as the safer haven asset classes. So far in 2022, we have not seen that gold and silver have performed to that uh, respect. But going forward, uh, one, on gold first, uh, do you think that $1680 an ounce that we saw was the bottom and you're going to see prices rise from here and your outlook on the gold? Yes, actually, so one thing should clarify. So we are S&P Global, obviously, you know, a multi-business unit company. Yeah. So we have a central economic team which puts out kind of the economic forecast and the chances of recession and what the GDP growth outlook, et cetera, are. And, uh, you know, the commodity stream obviously focuses mostly on commodity areas. So we as a company kind of, you know, have, have a view on what the recessionary outlook, et cetera, is. Um, ha having said that, um, you know, similar to um, what I mentioned earlier, we track these movements closely. But right now, um, you know, it, it would seem that uh, the market is somewhat discounting the threat of a recession, which okay. is, uh, again, we are very data-based and we look at economic, economic models to kind of make up our minds and mm -hmm. we are not particularly swayed by, uh, you know, general population yeah. and what, what they feel. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like, you know, all of that's translating into the markets. But, um, you know, I would say that if you look at recent history, I think some of those traditional linkages between recession and price of gold, etc., are also at this point maybe a little questionable, okay. partly because um, you know you've had recessionary blips in the past and commodity prices have moved in different directions. Yes, I think the other thing no one's really talking about much in the context of a recession strategy is it's not just whether a recession happens or not; mm -hmm. it's how long yeah. and how deep, yes. right? So yes. technically, we had a recession at least in the US, right around 2020, yeah. the second quarter, right? Just about two but months. Exactly. It was very short-lived mm -hmm. and, you know, the bounce back happened quickly. But we also have to keep in mind that back then certain things happened like massive fiscal stimulus 
uh, to prevent a depression, etc., which probably won't happen with a regular, yeah, yeah. what I'd call a business cycle recession. Mm -hmm. So is this going to be a business cycle recession? Oh, well, for most part, it seems like it will be a business okay. cycle recession unless it's precipitated by a big event mm -hmm. like, you know, COVID or something. And, you know, God knows I don't want to see another yeah. event like that in my lifetime. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it'd probably be a regular business cycle recession if it happens. And um, we'll get out of it eventually. And uh, knock on wood, we as uh, policy, uh, you know, companies and policymakers and governments and central banks mm. have learned a lot over the last 10 years, 15 years about how to manage these cycles. And mm. we've come out of it quickly and stronger. Hopefully so. So on gold and silver, your outlook for 2023? Um, I personally don't have an outlook. Mm. But as I said, you know, we do a ton of research to make sure that we can produce um, um, data and research, uh, Sakshi, which helps yeah. customers make decisions with sure. conviction. Sure. And that's what we tend to be focused on. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, some of the most interesting areas we uh, get questions on are actually beyond the precious <laughs> metals and just metals. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of investor interest in areas like, for example, carbon markets globally yes. yeah. and uh, transition fuels, hydrogen. Um, and uh, those seem to be some of the very exciting areas where people are doing a lot of primary research, yes. a lot of it based on our data. And uh, investors are making choices about whether these are markets they want to play in long term yeah. and uh, what the outlook is. Right. So where does India stand among all of this? I mean, we've been having this commodity conversation, but in global commodity conversations, yeah. you know, how important is India market for you? Well, um, so there are two parts to that question, or at least as I yes. interpret it, actually. Yeah. One is, for us, we have a nice commercial presence in India. And the business has been growing nicely and we obviously want to serve our you know, customers here. And I think there's a potential to do a lot more work with clients, both existing clients and new clients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the secular growth story for India is pretty strong. The GDP is going to continue to grow nicely. There's a billion four people here. The markets are going to grow. As the markets grow, you know, um, our customers are going to do well. And they'll have to make some big decisions around mm -hmm various commodities, energies, and choices around that. And we want to be there in the trenches and the front lines to be helping them do that, right? Yeah. So commercially, we are very excited about the opportunity here. We want to continue to grow our business. Mm. It, it, as far as India as a market or the country as such is concerned, um, you know, we've been hearing some very interesting things that coming out of India around, you know, public policy, around uh, energy transition, yeah. energy con uh, yeah. con Converse, conservation, mm -hmm. um, hydrogen, solar, etc. And my view is um, that you know it could be really exciting times for India. I'll yeah. give you two two examples. One is um, India could actually leapfrog an entire generation of technology to get to something that's state of the art. And the analogy I give people is um, phones, right? If you go back 20 years ago in India, it was incredibly hard to get a landline phone. You yes. had to wait for three, five, six years to get a landline phone. And we didn't get to a place in India where everybody got a landline phone and then people started getting cell phones. We just skipped the whole landline transition and went straight to cell phones. Something similar could happen on energy, mm -hmm. where as India gets richer and wealthier and the economy grows, yes. we don't have to wait for there to be 50 coal-fired plants and then convert those to new forms of energy. And you know, your investors and your viewers would note that new opportunities will arise when a full generation gets skipped and India goes directly to solar and hydrogen and LNG, etc. So yes. that's one. Second is, I think this opportunity in India will spur a lot of innovation, mm -hmm. especially around things like green hydrogen, solar, etc., which India could become an exporter, an exporter of not just consume the technology domestically, yeah, yeah. but also export it globally. And that's a huge opportunity for India. And I think both of these... Uh, coupled with some secular growth, some tailwinds, um, and you know, well-informed public policy mm -hmm. is going to help um, India. And I would, the third thing I would say, actually, is that you know the policy in India has been quite pragmatic, yes. which is really been focused on. I would go back to the three things I mentioned: energy transition, yeah. energy security, and energy affordability. Mm -hmm. And tough times happen. Like right now, we are in a tough time with high soaring energy prices. It's really pleasant to see that you know the core principles of seeking energy transition have not been abandoned. And there's a pragmatic approach to make yes. sure that 
the whole country can transition to new sustainable forms of energy while making sure that there's affordable energy for growth and development and to keep the economy running. Okay, I understood that. And uh, good to hear that, you know, India is on the you know growth path when it comes to renewable resources and the new energy forms as well. And uh, we'll hope to see how fast we can, you know, uh, skip this generation like you talked about. Uh, for you specifically, what are going to be your key focus areas in India and, uh, you know, where are you going to be putting your focus? Right. So, um, there are two, two parts to the India story for both yeah. S&D Global and for S&D Global Commodity Insights in particular. One is, uh, we obviously, as I said, we see a huge commercial opportunity. We want to be present here. We want to have a vibrant uh, commercial team here engaging with customers. We want researchers yeah. who are focused on the India story, um, granular market research and uh, you know insights that we can obviously provide our customers with and help them make decisions with conviction. That's one part of it. The other bigger part of the India story is around talent. And, um, you know, we do a lot of high-end research, software engineering, data work here. And for any of your viewers who are looking for a career in a fast-growing business, which is focused on solving meaningful, sustainable problems for clients and making the world a better place, this is a great place to be. Okay. Okay. And we want to continue to grow our presence for Commodity Insights, you know, about 4,500 colleagues about 20-25% are already in India and uh, we definitely want to make sure that we can continue to do the talent development that we've done in India for decades to come. Okay, well all the best to that and thank you so much for being with us and sharing all these insights and commodities. I'm sure all the viewers will benefit from it. Volatile times ahead but definitely good times coming in for commodities going forward from here. Thanks a lot for joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Sakshi. Thank you. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.